It's out there. I have one every, about once or twice a year. I call it a word in season, and it just takes my four or five best sermons that I think I've preached this year. Now, I guess I have others on staff that vote on it. But anyway, uh, put uh, CDs in there, and there's just some great teaching in there on the, what I consider the best that I have done lately. So that's out there on the table. Then there's also some books. And if you don't study the Word of God verse by verse, I just highly recommend it. Uh, uh, new converts are always asking me, how do you study the Word of God? And I tell them, well, study it by topics. That's the way you always begin. Just pray and see what the Lord lays on your heart, whether it's love or grace or faith or righteousness or your daily walk with God. Just start on those and start learning those subjects. But after you have about maybe eight or nine subjects you've studied, start to study verse by verse, and you'll find out every book of the Bible just tells the same things over and over again as far as those subjects are concerned, but with a different background. Whether it's Old Testament, New Testament, Jerusalem, or, you know, or Galatia, or whatever, whatever uh, background there is, Old Testament, New Testament, the same subjects are taught throughout the Word of God, but you get a different insight. You get to it from, uh, from uh, say, Isaiah, or you get to it from uh, the book of Jonah or others where that gospel is preached there, and you'll find out really God's saying the same thing but in a different way to different people. And so, again, it helps you to understand the Word of God. I recommend highly that you study it verse by verse. And one thing about it is it'll do two things for you. Either, number one, it'll reinforce what you've learned, or else it'll tell you, no, you were wrong. To get it in context, to find out the verses before, the verses after. And again, I highly recommend that. That's out there on the table, and there are some special things out there, some special prices. And then I do have a card out there if you'd like to become a partner with me. Partnership is more than just joining with a person. You know, well, I'm going to be partners with Pastor Bob, whatever. You, you really partner around a vision. That's the main thing you partner around. And my vision is to help raise up a new generation of ministers, young ministers today, who believe in the two things that never change, the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Everything else can change. Music changes. Technology changes. Thank God I don't have to wear a tie anymore. Thank you, Jesus. And uh, don't have to wear a suit anymore. Thank you, Jesus. Although there's some churches I go to still demand it, and so I rebuke them under my breath and go preach there anyway. And, uh, but again, thank God for the things that do change. But see, so many Christians get wrapped up in the things that change and get mad about them. And they just stop. Or so many ministers today, they're, they're actually throwing away things they shouldn't throw away, such as they don't teach the Word hardly anymore and they never refer to the Holy Spirit. And those are the two things that should never, ever change. And, and Psalms tells us, if the foundations are destroyed, what will the righteous do? Not what will the sinner do? What will the righteous do? We as righteous people need foundations for our life, but if they go messing with the foundations, we've got a problem. It's like our nation, man. We're fiddling with foundations today that should never be fiddled with. There's just things that never go away. Some things change. We ought to talk about things that change, but there's some things that should not change. And it's the same way with the Word of God. So my ministry is to help raise up a generation of young ministers. I go to ministers' conferences, and I go to Bible colleges and speak a lot to students, but reinforcing those things that don't change. And you're helping me to help raise up a generation of young ministers who will see those things that don't change and carry this on into the next generation. And to me, this is where revival starts when we come back to foundational truths. Amen? Boy, you guys are just shouting real loud, and I really appreciate it so much. <laughs> Open with me to John chapter 14 this morning. I have just had such a desire to minister to congregations also on the power and ministry of the Holy Spirit. And uh, again, those things that don't change and come back to something that's changed so much. You know, sadly, uh, among churches where the revivals really broke out in the early 1900s, Azusa Street, 1940s and 50s, the healing revivals, the charismatic movement of the late 60s on into the early 80s. It was one of the longest revivals our nation had around the gifts of the Holy Spirit is that churches that were so instrumental in teaching in those areas and preaching in those areas have changed. And sadly, one of them is the Assemblies of God today. And I mean, my friends were Assemblies. I was raised around the Assemblies of God, so strong in believing in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but in the name of trying to keep people in the church and not offending people, they don't minister on the Holy Spirit much. In fact, it was even written in a magazine, Charisma Magazine, sometime back on the history of the charismatic movement, the history of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the instrumental stand and foundational stand of the Assemblies of God. And today they said only 30% of the pastors of the Assemblies of God even believe in being filled with the Holy Spirit, and only 30% of those allow it in church. 
And what a sad change that we see, but you know what? We're seeing changes all around that area in the name of trying to keep people in the church. It comes back to, are you going to try to keep people or stick with truth? Now, the point of it is, you know, I understand when you go to church and somebody speaks in tongues. I was raised in a Pentecostal church. They talk about how embarrassing it was. I know because I was a kid in a Pentecostal church praying sister so-and-so wouldn't stand up and speak in tongues. <laughs> I used to pray that. And then I bring a friend to church going, oh, God, I just brought a friend to church. Don't have her. And sure enough, she'd stand up. She'd be sitting right behind us. And she'd let it go. My friend would just freak out, you know, what's going on? But what I understand today, and especially from the scriptures, is this. The scripture says that the congregation sits in the seat of the unlearned. They don't sit in the seat of the skeptical. They don't sit in the seat of, of irritable. They sit in the seat of the unlearned, which means just learn them. That's what we say in the South. Learn them. And so that's all that needs to be is an instruction. I was just telling pastor, I was at a church in, uh, in uh, just outside of Pittsburgh here a few months ago, and they had and the three, three services on Sunday morning of probably three to four hundred per service, and there was a prophecy given in the church. A person stood up and gave a prophecy. The pastor was up in the pulpit in no time. And this was during praise and worship. The pastor stood there, and when the prophecy was over, above his head on a screen were three scriptures listed. He said, for those of you that are visiting today and maybe don't understand what's going on, write these scriptures down and go home and look it up. And you'll find out that God still speaks through you in a church service, not just me, the pastor, or the praise and worship, he can speak through you, and it still is true today as it ever was back then. And he took one minute and explained it. I thought, how simple. Now they're no longer unlearned. Now they know what the Word has to say. And really what we're doing is in the face of what people might think and fear, we don't explain it to them. Because people want the supernatural today. How do you know that Satan is supernatural? But how do you know God is supernatural? How do you know God's supernatural is bigger than Satan's supernatural? And we need to tell the people that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And there's so much demonic activity in the world today, but we're not teaching people that you have the power over demons to step on them and tread on them. And this is what the Word of God has to say. I could stop there. That was a good sermon. But John chapter 14, if you look there with me, at verse 16, here Jesus speaking to his disciples says, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you till next week. Is that what it says? Forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. If you have a Bible that you can mark in, underline that phrase, whom the world cannot receive. If you can, you know, do it in your iPad, then do it and color it but whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and shall be in you. I want you to notice something. He made a differentiation between you and the world. He made a differentiation between the world and you. He said, he said you have something that the world can't have. The world cannot have the Holy Spirit. The world cannot receive the Holy Spirit because it neither... Oh, I love the way that Jesus is so... The Word of God is so accurate. It says the world cannot see Him, nor does He know Him, but you know Him. I'm going to say that again. The world neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him. He says something here. You've never seen Him. The world doesn't believe in God because they've never seen Him, nor do they know Him. But if you know Him, you don't have to see Him. In fact, the more I know Him, I don't care if I see Him. I don't have to see him. I think one of the strongest areas of unbelief you can have say, Jesus, if you just show up in my bedroom and tell me what to do. He lives in you. Guidance comes in you. Guidance comes from the Word. 90% of your guidance comes from the Word. Amen? The Bible says he'll show you from the Word of God. He'll lead you into all truth. I had a man tell me in the congregation, I prayed for guidance. All I got was Scripture. Honestly, he said that, and I said, really? And, and he said, I said, but how do you know that wasn't God? He goes, but I could think of the Scripture. I could think of Scripture. How could that be God if I could think about it? I said, let me ask you a question. Was the Scripture in line with what you were asking for? Yes. You realize there's 7,000 promises in the Word of God, and you happen to think of the only one that really lined up with what your need was, and you're telling me that wasn't supernatural? It had to be God. He said, I never thought about that. 
all those scriptures, and I thought of the one that could possibly bring me out of this situation. I said, it's like the Holy Spirit's a divine computer going, here it is, right here, and gives you the scripture that applies to your situation. Most of your guidance comes from the Word of God, but we are often missing the supernatural because we're looking for the spectacular. And all God wants us to trust him for is the supernatural. When it comes along, we go, ho-hum. Well, that might be okay. It's just part of your daily life to be guided by the scripture. But again, he says here that you are different from the world. Let me tell you else what's different from the world. He didn't say that the world and you are the same. Why do I say that? He says, you are you and that's the world. I know that's not a deep statement, but think about this for just a moment. We're being told today and taught today under universalism, the world's already saved. That would make you and the world the same. But he puts a differentiation between you and the world. He said, you and them. He said, they can't receive the Holy Spirit, but you can because you see him or you know him, and they've neither seen him nor know him. So he says here again, whom the world cannot receive. Notice it didn't say will not, they cannot. It's impossible for the world to receive the Holy Spirit because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. So he doesn't say here in this verse of scripture about the Holy Spirit that they are the same, or that the world is the same as us. No, they don't have the Holy Spirit, nor can they ask him for it, but you have him. He lives with you and shall be in you in the days to come. Now, there are two ministries of the Holy Spirit that you get automatically when you get saved. All right? You didn't ask for it. It just comes with it. First of all, the Bible tells us as far as the world is concerned, it says in John chapter 16, verses 8 and 9, when he has come, that's the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin. So when you're a sinner, is there a ministry of the Holy Spirit? The answer is yes. There's a separate ministry after you're saved where you receive him. But in this particular case, he just ministers to you. In fact, when you hear the gospel, he convicts you. My mom told me when my dad and her were saved, they met during after World War II, and he was based in Louisiana, and they met there. She was from Louisiana. But anyway, after they got out, they happened to be at a church. They didn't want to go to church, but they were staying in someone's basement, and they yelled down the stairs at him, you kids want to go to a revival. My dad asked my mom, what's a revival? My mom was raised Baptist but never got saved. My dad was Armenian, so came out of an Armenian church. And he never received Jesus. He said, what's a revival? She said, it's a church meeting. He said, I don't want to go to church. She said, but they're giving us the room free. He said, okay. So they went to church. <laughs> my mom said during that entire sermon that night, my dad shook under conviction of the Holy Spirit. This verse says he will convict the world. My dad shook and my mom said when the invitation was given, she said he jumped up and ran to the front. So she jumped up and ran right behind him. <laughs> and they got born again that night. Three nights later, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. See, there's a ministry of the Holy Spirit after you're born again, but you have to receive it. But the Holy Spirit convicting you. Then there's another verse that says that the Holy Spirit will draw you. So there's a drawing. Not only does he convict you, he starts pulling you toward Jesus. You still have to make up your own mind, but God's out there doing everything he can. Satan's doing everything he can. He's resisting God's pulling, but you have the choice. God can't make you receive Jesus, but here's the other good thing. Satan can't stop you from receiving Jesus. And so this is what happened. And he's saying here in this verse of Scripture, whom the world cannot receive. But the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. The world can receive Jesus. John chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, he came to his own and his own received him not. But as many as did receive him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. That verse says that the world can receive Jesus. I like to think of it this way. Jesus is God's gift to the world. The Holy Spirit is God's gift to his children. Once you receive Jesus, then you can receive the Holy Spirit. And he's saying in this verse of Scripture, the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. But you can because really you come through first of all receiving the blood of Jesus Christ and once the blood cleanses you then he can put the oil of the Holy Spirit into your life but the blood has to come first salvation has to come first receiving Jesus has to come first and then after that he has something for you where it is receiving the Holy Spirit so again God's children can receive the Holy Spirit the cleansing blood of Jesus is first then the anointing oil of the Holy Spirit 
Receiving Jesus gives you eternal life and gives you heaven. But receiving the Holy Spirit gives you power in this life. I'm going to say that again. The new birth gets you saved and qualified for heaven. But being filled with the Holy Spirit gives you a little bit of heaven on earth before you get there. I'm in the devil's world. And God delights in giving me joy unspeakable in the midst of the devil's world. He delights in giving me depression unknown, and I have joy unknown. By receiving the Holy Spirit, I can now operate the supernatural. I can see lives set free, and the whole purpose of why God left you here was to get other people saved. On top of that, he left you here to get other people saved and gave you power to equip you to do it. That's what happens to you when you receive the Holy Spirit. So he said, concerning receiving the Holy Spirit, whom the world cannot receive. So, the Holy Spirit receiving Him gives you power in this life. Think about this. As Christians, you can receive two members of the Godhead. Jesus and the Holy Spirit. That's God's gifts to you. God's gift to sinners, Jesus. God's gift to Christians, the Holy Spirit. Man, that's incredible, isn't it? To know that I have two members of the Godhead living in me, Jesus Christ himself and the Holy Spirit. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. We'll turn to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. There are a number of chapters, starting in chapter 4, going through the end of chapter 9, that are all just one big long teaching. And here's how it starts. In chapter 4, we're told back in the beginning of chapter 4, that Jesus went about every city and every village teaching, preaching, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And that was multitudes. In fact, it said great multitudes followed him. I read a commentary one time. They said, if the word multitudes is used, it usually means tens of thousands. If great multitudes it used, it means over 100,000. It could be 100, 200,000 people. And it says in this case, great multitudes followed him from Jerusalem, Judea, Decapolis, from beyond the Jordan. It says literally Arabic countries, Gentile countries. The fame of Jesus went everywhere beyond Jerusalem and Judea, even across the Jordan into other countries, and people from all nationalities were coming, and the crowds numbered hundreds of thousands of people following Jesus and said he healed every one of them. Well, I can guarantee you one thing. He didn't lay hands on them. He wouldn't have time. The masses got healed by simply the spoken word. Jesus healed by his word. I I don't know how many of you know uh, um, eh, Marilyn Hickey. You know Marilyn Hickey? Okay, Marilyn Hickey is a friend of mine. We've known each other for years. We swap each other's notes, and then after a while we swap so many notes, we quit telling people where we got them. She called me one day and said, I've been using your notes for two months. I'm so sorry I didn't give you any credit. I said, Marilyn, I've been using your stuff for years and never given you credit. So, again, we laugh with each other. She's now 87 years old and still traveling. And she she goes into, into Muslim countries and preaches Jesus. Think about that, especially Pakistan. She goes into Pakistan, a Muslim country, and she's a woman preaching Jesus. I mean, that's just two strikes against her right there, but they love her. You know why? She comes in with miracles, signs, and wonders. And she didn't come with any agenda. She just comes and just talks about Jesus and healings occur. And she told me the numbers were small when she first began, a few hundred at a time, and she'd lay hands on people. Now, she said the numbers are anywhere from four to 500,000 people come at a time, as far as your eye can see. And she says, she said, I actually got the point. Now she said, I walk out on the platform and I don't even get a chance to preach. The power of God hits me and I start making pronouncements and thousands of people get healed at a time running to the front, running to the front, and the nation loves her, the, the, the president of Pakistan loves her, opens up the doors for her every time she comes, and her fame got heard of on NBC. NBC called her one day, and they said, we have a morning program nationwide, we'd love to put you on there, and tell, tell us what happened. She said, no, not unless you send a producer with me. And they said, well, okay. So she packed up, got a producer from the program to go with her, from NBC, traveled with her to Pakistan, and she put him on the platform in a chair and said, just sit there. She walked out on the platform. He said, as far as the eye could see, hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, just just masses of people. 
And he, she walked out on the platform. The moment she walked out, the power of God began to hit, and people started running to the front and throwing their crutches up there and wheelchairs and all this other stuff, just throwing stuff up, trying to run up on the platform and give their testimony. And then she went back and did NBC, and they were talking to her about it, and she said, don't ask me, ask him. And all he had was eyes this big. He kept going, I've never seen anything like that in my life. I've never seen anything like that in my life. Talk about the power of God, the power of God, the power of God. But you see, that's why God has given us that power so we can see people filled with the Holy Spirit and born again. And Jesus' ministry got so large that he couldn't lay hands on people. And literally, the, the, when you have that many hundreds of thousands of people coming, you just speak the word and they start getting healed. But he healed everybody that was coming to him. And in chapter 5, it got so bad that Jesus had to take his disciples and separate from everybody. He didn't tell anybody where he was going. He took the disciples up on a mountain and taught them the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount was not directed to multitudes, but the multitudes found him. Halfway through chapter 7, the multitudes found him, and he suddenly switched his teaching on how to be a follower, how to work with Jesus, how to be a part of a team. And halfway through chapter 7, he changed the entire sermon to which road are you going down, which gate will you walk through, eternal life or damnation, and after you're born again, are you building on a rock or are you building on sand? He changed the whole thing to a discipleship and salvation message. And then in chapter 8, he comes down the mountain, and in chapter 8 and chapter 9, we now see him heal individuals. And the individuals are listed. But the individuals simply amplify what was taught back in chapter 4, and that is he healed every body of everything. All it does is tell us that. In chapter 8 and 9, we now find out he heals every body of everything. He healed women and men and old and young and Jew and Gentile, rich and poor, incurable people with mo Peter's mother-in-law with a fever. I mean, he had incurable diseases down to common fevers. Everything he did, he healed one, he healed two, he cast out devils. All these ones simply amplify he healed everybody of everything and he even raised a dead girl. I mean, the whole thing brings out he heals everybody. He didn't ask if they made money, he said, and he healed a centurion's son, which was a wealthy man, and the first one he meets is a guy that is a leper. And, of course, lepers didn't have any money. And this leper came to him. Why was the leper the first one? Because leprosy is a type of sin. He represents all mankind. And this man is the most vast of all of them because of what he represents. Let's take a look in chapter 8 of Matthew. And it says in verse 1, when he came down from the mountain, this is the Sermon on the Mount, great multitudes followed him. Again, hundreds of thousands of people following him that found him on the mountain. And a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. It said, Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said, see that you tell no one, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Them are the priests. This will be a testimony to them. Why was a leper and his cleansing the first one recorded? It's the first one recorded in Matthew, and honestly, it's the first one recorded in the New Testament. Up until now, he healed masses, but we're not told about individuals. He's the first individual mentioned in the New Testament who received cleansing from the Lord Jesus Christ. So, leprosy is a type of all of us. Although we are all born again, and uh, pardon me, although we are all born sinners, leprosy is a type of sin. Leprosy began in the blood and manifested itself as sores in the skin. In other words, it was in you before you ever knew it. And then it manifests itself on the outside. You see, we are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. It's a manifestation of something already in us. And when it manifests on the outside, that's not when we became a sinner. We were a sinner long before that because we were born a sinner. All have sinned. Past tense and present tense come short of the glory of God. So we are all born sinners, and this is what this man represented. He represented all mankind. Leprosy was the only disease that when healed was called cleansed. Let me say that again. Leprosy is the only disease in the Bible that when it was healed was called cleansed. Now, it was healed, but it wasn't called a healing. It was called a cleansing. Isn't that interesting? Next of all, when crowds saw a leper coming, they didn't cry sick, they yelled unclean. 
because this person needed to have cleansing. This leper didn't ask to be healed, he asked to be made clean. Even he knew that. And Matthew tells us that his leprosy was cleansed, not healed. It said when he came to Jesus, his leprosy was cleansed. Why is this important? Because curing a leper was a miracle, not a healing. I'm going to say that again. Cleansing a leper was not a, was not a healing, it was a miracle. Whenever you find a leper that was cleansed, it was immediate. It wasn't a process. It didn't say he went and later on found himself to be cleansed of leprosy. I mean, cleansing of leprosy was total and immediate. Therefore, it represented a miracle. And so, curing leper again was a miracle. Some healings are compared to salvation, but not like leprosy. Leprosy, Jesus, in fact, le separated leprosy from every other disease. He told his disciples, heal the sick, cleanse the leper. Separated the two. Cleansing comes from Jesus' blood. Healing comes from his stripes. Now again, leprosy was healed, but they didn't call it that because comparing it to salvation, your sins are not healed by the stripes of Jesus. Your sins are cleansed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And any leper in the word of God who was ever cleansed had to usually go dip somewhere, not be touched by a physician or even touching out of hands. Now that Jesus did this time, but in the Old Testament, whenever the leper was cleansed, Naaman, he had to go dip in the Jordan seven times, and the Bible says he came up cleansed, completely clean of leprosy. That's just good preaching, Bob. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Next of all, when cured... When cleansed, a leper didn't go see a doctor. He went and saw the priest. And the priest examined him. Not a, not a doctor. We often say today to people, that go to your doctor and, and it'll be proven. In this case, they don't go see a doctor. They go see a priest. And the priest was the one that saw him. The only two lepers in the Bible who had ever been cured, ever been cleansed, neither one of them saw a priest. The first one was Miriam. That was Moses' sister. She rebelled against Moses, spoke out against him, told him basically, I can run this nation as good as you can, and boom, she was struck with leprosy from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. The Bible says her skin turned pure white with leprosy. When she repented, she was cleansed. But she didn't go see a leper. You know why? Because the law hadn't been given yet. That was before the law was given. Another leper, Naaman, in the Old Testament was cleansed long after the law was given, but he was a, he was a Syrian. He was a Gentile. He didn't have to go see the priest. And so when he was cleansed, he went back home. It wasn't required of him since he wasn't a Jew to do so. Which tells us something. Those are the only two lepers cleansed until the time of this leper being cleansed. Neither one of them in the Old Testament went to see a priest. You know what that tells me? When Jesus said, go see the priest, the priests were shocked. <laughs> what? This is found in Leviticus chapter 14. And when this guy came, they said, what happened? He said, I was, I was a leper. In fact, my, my name was on the leper's rolls. You can see right here, I brought them. But I've been cleansed of leprosy. And the man that cleansed me said, I'm supposed to come and see you. I didn't know that, but he said, I'm supposed to come see you. In fact, I can't go see anybody until I've seen you first. And he said, when I come to see you, you're going to know what to do because Moses told you what to do. And they're probably going, ba -ba 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 -ba. really? And they're searching through the scrolls back there, blowing the dust off of them. What are we going to do? And they looked and looked until they finally found Leviticus chapter 14. They knew it was there. They had to memorize it. As a priest, you had to memorize the first five books of the Bible, of which Leviticus is one of them, but they didn't know where it was. And they had to search and search. This man was probably standing out there for a while waiting on these guys. They were going, just a minute, a little while up, and looking. And finally opened up. They said, here it is, blew the dust off, and probably had to read it to know what to do. They'd never had a cleansed leper coming. Jesus said, go and show them as a testimony. What was the testimony? Messiah had come. Jesus had arrived. So let's go to the law of the leper and find out what happened. Let's find out what happened with this poor guy. Not poor guy, he's now healed and cleansed and all that. Let's find out what happened. Leviticus chapter 14, I want you to look with me at verses 1 through 7. And here's what the Lord spoke to Moses. It says in verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, this shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. I want you to notice something, the day of his cleansing, not the week of his cleansing, not the month of his cleansing. It happened in a split second. 
He was cleansed in one day. Just like your sins are forgiven in one day. Aren't you glad that salvation isn't a process? Man, I got it and boom. I mean, I walk away and in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, I'm a brand new creation. Old things have been washed away and leprosy was immediately cleansed. Now you go walking off as a cleansed leper. It says, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, this shall be the law of the leper. In the day of his cleansing, he will be brought to the priest and the priest will go out of the camp and examine him, and indeed, if the leprosy is healed in the leper, the priest will command to be taken for him. Who is to be cleansed? Two living clean birds. Now, underline the word birds, they're actually sparrows. The cheapest of all birds and the cheapest of all sacrifices was of the, of the leper, because he couldn't afford much. In fact, we're told in chapter 10 of Matthew, aren't two, aren't two sparrows sold for a farthing? It was for this offering. Two sparrows. Sold for a farthing. A farthing is three-eighths of one cent. That's how cheap they were. And he goes on to say there, And the birds will be killed in an earthen vessel, verse 5. The priest will take and, and command one of the birds to be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. And the living bird, he will take it, the cedar wood and scarlet and the hyssop, and dip them and the living bird into the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he will sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed from leprosy. Pronounce him cleansed, and the living bird will be loosed into the open field. Let's talk about that for just a moment. He brought two birds, two sparrows. One sparrow was killed, and the other sparrow was put under the running water. They killed the one, sliced it open, the blood that came out, they put it under running water, and under the running water they put it into a bowl, and then this bird was put into the bowl, dipped into the water, and then allowed to go free. So the bird that was alive was dipped into the blood and running water of the other bird. The two birds represent you and Jesus. I want you to notice he didn't say go buy two eagles or go buy two expensive birds. Go buy the cheapest of birds. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't come to this earth as an eagle to die for sparrows? He came to this earth and became a sparrow to die for all mankind. He became the lowest common denominator on this earth so that every one of us, rich or poor, male or female, old or young, Jew or Gentile, black or white, doesn't matter, all of us, he came as the lowest common denominator and died for us. The bird that was cut open was Jesus and the bird, living bird that was dipped in his blood was you and me and then whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Oh, hallelujah. That's just good stuff. Now, a moment that happened, after all this happened, then the priest, now notice again, he went outside the camp. The priest had to go outside the camp. That's where Jesus died, outside the camp. Outside the camp represents sinners. And sinners are outside the camp. When you get born again, you get to come into the camp. The camp is the church. All right? Of which we're meeting today. And so... Again, they went outside the camp, and then once they found him to be cleansed, and they went through the process of the two birds and the running water, then they shaved this man completely. They shaved his head, they shaved his beard, they shaved his eyebrows, they shaved his entire body, and the man got to move back into town. He probably found his old tent somewhere and set it back up, but for seven days, this man could not go into his tent. Day and night for seven days, he stayed outside of his, of his tent. And he put on some clothes and stuff, but you can now see because he had been shaved all over that this man had no more leprosy. That's why he did it. See, when you're born again, it's time to go show everybody you've been born again. Don't hide in your house. Man, go tell everybody whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Man, everybody can go by and he can show that. Look at this arm. Isn't that good looking arm? See, no leprosy at all. Look at my head. No leprosy at all. Even my scalp. Look, there's no leprosy anywhere on me I was cleansed and the priest even pronounced me cleansed and for seven days I'm showing you everything and then on the eighth day after all this happened after seven days on the eighth day he got to go back into his house but also on the eighth day there was another sacrifice made for him let's go to the next portion of scripture go with me to verse 10 on, again on the eighth day when a day 10 begins he's reshaved but not all over, just his head, just his beard, just his eyebrows, all the hair on his head was, was shaved, and he goes back, and now he goes for another sacrifice. Only this time, look what it says in verse uh, 10. 
On the eighth day, say the eighth day. That's so important. On the eighth day, he will take two male lambs without blemish, one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish, three-tenths of an ephah of fine mixed, uh, a fine flour mixed with, uh, a first, pardon me, fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering and one log of oil. Then the priest who makes him clean will present the man who is to be made clean and his things before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. No longer is the sacrifice outside the camp, it's in the camp. And right by the door where the priest minister. It goes on to say there, verse 12, And the priest will take one male lamb offered as a trespass offering and the log of oil and will wave them as a wave offering before the Lord. Then he will kill the lamb in the place where he kills the sin offering and the burnt offering in a holy place. And for the sin offering of the priest, so is the trespass offering, it is most holy. The priest will take some of the blood of the trespass offering and the priest will put it on the tip of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, on the thumb of the right hand and on the big toe of the right foot. What did the priest do? The priest killed these sacrifices and the man was standing there eight days after his cleansing Seven days of showing himself in the camp. Now on the eighth day, he's reshaved on his head and he comes and so the priest offers a sacrifice and the blood of the lamb, he puts it on his finger and he puts it on the tip of the right ear and on the right thumb of the hand, on the tip of the right thumb, and then he put it, you can keep your shoes on. <laughs> he put it on the tip of the big toe on the right foot. Now why is that? Because once you're born again, you're cleansed by the blood of Jesus. But let me tell you, why on the ear? Because the ear that never could hear God before can now hear God. You begin to understand something. The moment I'm born again, I know I'm a child of God. My spirit bears witness with him that I'm a child of God. I know what the Lord's telling me. I mean, I just know those things. Before this, I never knew I was a Christian. Now that I'm born again, I know I'm a Christian. It's just like, you can ask me and I'll go, I just know it. I just know it. It's like I could hear from God right here on this ear. I could hear from God next to all on the right thumb. The works that you used to do are now being done by the blood and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I no longer just put clothes on a man's back that doesn't have any clothes. I can use those clothes to tell him about the robes of righteousness. I no longer just feed a hungry man. I can now tell him about the bread of life. Understand something, I love the fact that churches offer food and clothing, but we are not a charity organization. We're not competing with, with a Salvation Army. We're not competing with the Goodwill, which all those places do is just give clothes. Listen, we can give clothes and we should give clothes, but it's used to, so a person can receive Jesus. We give food so a person can receive Jesus. All the things we do are works to help introduce them to one that can get them in, employed themselves and working for the Lord and working for Jesus. And so we can take and change their lives. In other words, we're not just giving a man a fish anymore. We're teaching him how to fish. And then on the toe, now I no longer wander around in life. I've been given the great commission. The moment I'm born again, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Because your feet represent the gospel of Jesus. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of them that bring glad tidings of peace. And the big toe is the guiding one for the foot. I now know where to go. And I go into all the world and preach the gospel. All these wonderful things now. And Ephesians chapter 6 tells me my feet are covered with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So now I know I'm born again. Now I can do good works and see people get saved. And now I can go into all the world. I now have a mission in life. Isn't that wonderful? But we're not through yet. There's one more yet to go. Jump down with me to verse 15. Verse 15 says, The priest shall take some of the log of oil and pour it into the palm of his own left hand. Then the priest will dip his right finger in the oil that was in the left hand and sprinkle some of the oil with his finger seven times before the Lord. And the rest of the oil that's in his hand, the priest will put some on the tip of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot. Underline these next three words, on the blood. He put the oil on the blood. 
of the trespass offering. The rest of the oil that's in the priest's hand, he will put some on the head of him who is to be cleansed, so the priest will make atonement for him before the Lord. Next of all, he took the oil, and he took the oil and sprinkled it some before the Lord, and he put then in his left hand, poured some oil in his left hand, and took his finger and put it on top of the blood that was on the top of the ear, put it on the blood that was on the thumb, and then put the blood on the toe that was on the right foot. Why was the oil touching the blood? Because the oil couldn't touch the skin. The oil can only touch the blood. The blood can touch the skin. But the oil represents the Holy Spirit of which we are not holy until we receive the blood. Why can the blood touch us? Because Jesus became sin for us who knew no sin that I might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. The blood touched me and suddenly I became as righteous as God. Then the oil could be placed on top of the blood because the oil on top of the blood is whom the world cannot receive. I have to have the blood first before the oil can touch me. But what happens when the oil touches the blood? Exponential power. You shall receive power. You Christians, you believers, after the Holy Spirit's come upon you to be my witnesses, you think you can hear from God when you're born again? Wait till the oil touches your ear. Now you can have words of wisdom, words of knowledge, discerning of spirit. You can move into the gifts of the spirit and suddenly the hearing that you had before where you now understand I'm a child of God is dwarfed by the power of the Holy Spirit is exponentially everything begins to increase in your life. You think you can do good works with it on your thumb and feed those that are hungry? Now your hands can work in operations of miracles, signs and wonders, healing power of God. Through your hands can flow the power of God. You can raise the dead. All these things come with the expanded power of the Holy Spirit. And finally, it hits your big toe. And you think it's something you know, the Great Commission? Now you can know which country to go to. Now you can go what which province to go to, which city to go to, which side of the city to go to, which building to buy. I mean, the Lord can get it right down to fine-tuning in your life with the power of the Holy Spirit. The blood paints a wide vision and the Holy Spirit starts narrowing it down just for your life. I know I'm supposed to go into all the world, but I can't go into all the world. The Lord says, fine, I'll show you which part of the world you're supposed to go into. In other words, when he says go into all the world, he says go ye, plural, into all the world. He never asked one person to go into all the world, but all of us together can take over the whole world. Yeah, Paul was born again, but what happened after he was filled with the Holy Spirit? On his second missionary journey, he went back to Galatia where he went on his first missionary journey. As he was in Galatia, he started to leave Galatia and decide, I know what, I'll go north into Bithynia. And the Holy Spirit said, don't go. He said, okay, well, I'll go south into Asia. And this time the Holy Spirit forbid him to go. So he just kept going west. He came from the east. He wasn't going to go back to the east. He couldn't go north. He couldn't go south. So he just kept going west and had no direction except for probably a piece. He just followed that piece till he got to Troas. Got to Troas and probably walked out right to the Aegean Sea and said, Lord, unless I can walk on water, you better tell me what I'm supposed to do. And that night, in a vision, the Holy Spirit came to him and said, Macedonia. He actually saw a man from Macedonia, he saw a face of a man from Macedonia. He said, come over here. And he went to Philippi. The first city he went to became the strongest partners he ever had in the ministry. Stuck with him through thick and thin. Became the most church that stood by his side. Even commended them on three occasions. How that in a great trial of affliction they stuck with him. And helped him to spread the gospel throughout all the rest of Asia in that area. Went from there and he went to Thessalonica, Berea. He ended up in, in Athens and finally up in Corinth. And finally ended up in Ephesus. And Ephesus was a three year revival that shook the entire continent of Asia. And from there, six other churches began. From the church at Ephesus, six other churches started that became the seven churches of Asia in Revelation 1, 2, and 3. They all started from one church. And this all came from one man who was filled with the Holy Spirit and heard a direct voice of the Holy Spirit, which just being born again, you've got a general voice of the Holy Spirit, but being filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking with tongues. Thank God I speak with tongues more than you all. 
Paul said that. And on top of that, with all the speaking with tongues, God could direct him. And I'm simply here to tell you, you think you've heard from God before. Wait till you start to minister to the Lord in tongues. You'll start getting things from God that are so specific. My wife and I were driving down the Broken Arrow Expressway in Tulsa. One day we crossed Memorial on a bridge. Memorial ran under us. In the middle of the bridge, the Lord spoke to me and said, you're supposed to pastor Grace Fellowship. It's the church I was attending. My wife and I went there when it first started. We were part of the 52 people that helped start that church. The first pastor stayed for five years. The next pastor stayed for a year and a half. But that second pastor that was pastoring at the time had said he was looking at at least the next 30 years of his life. And a year and a half into his pastor, the Lord spoke to me and said, you're going to pastor the church. I got home and spoke to my wife and said, the Lord spoke to me on that bridge back there that I was supposed to take the church. He said, yeah, I knew it for about a month. So I thought, eh, <laughs> why do you know it before me? That, you know. Anyway, I got past that real quick. But you say, why did the Lord do it in the middle of a bridge? I think so every time you cross the bridge, you can remember that's where the Lord spoke to you. Raise a memorial right there, you know. Right across the street, over Memorial. That's a great thing. You know, I never thought about that, but it was right over Memorial. And so the Lord just had it as a memorial. And, you know, so my wife and I, we just both knew it, you know. And yet the pastor seemed to be happy there. The church seemed to be doing real well. It was prospering and growing. And I was studying for a Wednesday night sermon. I mean, I, I was teaching a class. We had a regular class that pastor had, and I had this class. And, and anyway, he had heard about the class, so part of the congregation came over there that night, and I'd been teaching for a number of weeks on the book of Joshua, and so I was in there studying one night, my wife walked into the office, she said, he's going to quit in one week. I said, you really think so? She said, one week. I mean, that's how specific the Holy Spirit got. I said, okay. So the following Wednesday, a week later, I was teaching, and he, wa- he, got, he went back and had a board meeting, he called all the board, all the board went back to an office, and they were in there for about 10 minutes. I saw him walk out that door and walk out the front door of the church. He never came back. And the board walked out there with their heads spinning. They're going, oh, my goodness. They came up to me and said, he just walked out and left us. I said, he did? Like I was surprised. And he said, yes, what are we going to do? And I said, I don't know. What are you going to do? And they said, would you fill in until we can find a pastor? And I said, yeah, I'll fill in. That's fine. So I filled in. They came back about a month later and said, we can't find anybody. Would you still fill in until we can find somebody? I said, yeah, I'll fill in. Third time they came. First time, second time. Now third time they came back to me and said, we still can't find anybody. Are you supposed to take the church? I said, yes. They said, okay. Familiarity breeds contempt. They knew me all those years. Well, would you mind passing a little bit longer? We're still going to look one more time and see if we can find somebody. I said, okay, go ahead. And so they did again, came back later and said, no, you're, you're, we think you're supposed to take the church. I said, okay. And 33 years later, I stepped down from it. 33 years I had that church. That's how specific it was. I've had those times happen so often. But you know what? It doesn't come just because I've got blood on my ear. It comes because the oil has been released on top of the blood on the ear. Exponential power given by the Holy Spirit. Oh, glory to God. Here's the interesting thing. A drop on the ear a drop on the thumb, a drop on the toe, and the remainder was poured over the head of the man that just shaved his head, all the rest on his head. You know what happens? The greatest part of being filled with the Holy Spirit, Scripture comes to life like you've never seen it before. Revelation from the Scripture, like things coming together, like, listen, you think it's something he guides you? I'm here to tell you, he helps you in your everyday guidance of the Word of God. Now you read things in the Word, and things like jumps off the page at you. Things you studied last month now come and fit in with this piece. You go, oh my goodness, like a puzzle. God just keeps putting things together. That's what happens the moment you are filled with the Holy Spirit. And people often ask, what good is being filled with the Holy Spirit? Are you kidding me? Right here it's telling you, you have things that never had been given to you before. Look with me at a few more verses of Scripture. Look at Acts chapter 8. showing that the Holy Spirit is received after we receive Jesus. Jesus is God's gift to the world. The Holy Spirit is God's gift to His children. And Jesus said, whom the world cannot receive. But we can receive Him. And I do want you to notice, just like salvation is received, so is the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in Acts 1.8, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit's come upon you. Look with me here at Acts chapter 8 and verse 14. This is the revival at Samaria. 
that Philip led the, con or led the people into. And it says in verse 14, When the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God. Notice they were born again. They received the message that Philip had preached. So they received the word of God. They sent Peter and John to them, who when they came prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Notice this, after you receive the message, you can receive the Holy Spirit. But the blood has to come first. Then comes the oil of the Holy Spirit. Verse 16, for as yet he had fallen on none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Look at Acts chapter 19 and verse 1. Acts chapter 19 and verse 1. It happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the coast uh, came, of the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, verse 2, said to them, Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Notice it's something that comes after salvation. And asked them, Had they received the Holy Spirit? Look at verse 6. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. This is receiving the Holy Spirit after you are born again. After receiving Jesus, there's another gift, and that gift is the gift of power of the Holy Spirit. I don't think you're as blind as to actually think Satan has no power when his power is increasing every day around us. The power of deception, the power of lying signs and wonders. In fact, we are told that as the end days come, we're going to see more and more lying signs and wonders. Supernatural things, but not attributed to God. And God has the true signs and wonders. And the true signs and wonders are greater than the false signs and wonders. And able to conquer. In fact, Jesus said before he left, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. The power that we have over Satan's power comes from the receiving the Holy Spirit. Would you bow your heads for just a moment? If you are here today and you say, Pastor... I've never received Jesus. I have no assurance if I died today I'd even go to heaven, but I'd like to know. I'd like to receive him as the Lord of my life, my Savior. And that comes by a simple act of faith. Jesus Christ came to this earth with you in mind. In fact, Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says, Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. You are the joy that was set before him. When he went to the cross, he saw your face. And that was his joy. That's why he endured the cross and died for you. And the reason why he saw you with joy is he saw you one day receiving him as your Lord and Savior. If you've never received Jesus, would you hold up your hand and say, Pastor Bob, I want to receive Jesus today. I want to give my life to him. He gave his life for me. I want to give him my life. Let him cleanse me from my sins. Let him give me eternal life. If you're here today and you'll say, Pastor Bob, I am saved. I am born again, but I have never been filled with the Holy Spirit. I've been touched by the blood, but I've never been touched by the oil. Today, I want to have that supernatural power from God. Would you lift up your hand, Pastor, today? I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. There's one hand, two hands, anybody else, three hands, anyone else. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit today. I want to receive the Holy Spirit. I'd like for everybody to stand, if you would. I would like to ask those three or four that raised up your hand to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to receive the Holy Spirit. Would you just do the next?